You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Hi friends, welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I am your host, James Corbett, podcasting to you as always from the sunny climes of western Japan on this 19th day of September, 2010. I'd like to welcome everyone back to the Corbett Report podcast and invite everyone, as always, to check into my websites, including the flagship website CorbettReport.com, as well as those other websites that I maintain, ClimateGate.tv, NewWorldNextWeek.blip.tv, AlQaedaDoesn'tExist.com, and ReportageBook.com, where you can find out more information about my forthcoming book, Reportage, Essays on the New World Order. I'd also like to ask my listeners to support some of those websites that help to support us, including TragedyAndHope.com, CascadiaPublicRadio.org, TV.GlobalResearch.ca, and RadioForAll.net. I should mention that, yes, indeed, the Corbett Report website was once again a victim of the GoDaddy uh, malicious code injection hack attack, so anyone who visited my website on Friday might have gotten a warning saying that their uh, computer might be infected with malicious software. That warning was just part of the malicious code and did not in and of itself indicate that anything had been done to your computer, but it tried to redirect you to another malicious website. And yes, I believe GoDaddy has now been apparently attempting to fix this problem for five months now and nothing has happened so rest assured that if nothing continues to happen the Corbett Report will be moving to other servers soon but uh, the problem has been cleared up and you should be not receiving that message at least not at the present time when you go to visit CorbettReport.com Also this week, I'd like to thank everyone who's continuing to send in their ideas for episode 150 of the Corbett Report podcast due to be released on the 3rd of October 2010 on the subject of how to defeat the New World Order. Some great suggestions have already come in through the contact form on CorbettReport.com and via the voicemail phone-in number 512-553-0297, 512-553-0297. So if you want to send in your idea, please do so in the next two weeks, and I will do my best to include it on the podcast, but of course, depending on the amount of ideas and suggestions we receive, I won't be able to include everyone's ideas, and preference will be given to those ideas that are brief as well as detailed, and I know that's a very tall order to fill, but again, try to keep your message brief and focused, preferably on a single idea so that people have an easier time of understanding what it is you're trying to put across. And also tomorrow, Monday the 20th of September, will be a public holiday here in Japan, so I will be constructing a YouTube video telling people how to uh, submit their ideas. So look for that on the CorbettReport.com homepage and on YouTube.com slash CorbettReport sometime tomorrow, Monday, September 20th, and you will also be able to reply to that video with a video response of your own, and video responses will also be considered for episode 150. So once again, there are many ways to get your ideas in. Finally today, I'd also like to say that I do appreciate, greatly appreciate, all of the donations that continue to come in through CorbettReport.com, and I'd just like to let everyone know that because of the generosity of listeners of late, I've been able to afford that new laptop, which I was talking about uh, wanting to buy in previous episodes. So I have now bought that, and as a result, I am now able to work on Reportage, the forthcoming book uh, collection of essays that you can see a uh, table of contents of at reportagebook.com. I'm uh, finally getting a lot of work done on that, and as a result, hope to have that released by the end of the year. So thank you once again to everyone who's continuing to support the Corbett Report, and please know that without your support, none of this would be possible. And on that note, let's get straight into today's episode. Here is today's Sunday Update. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com with your Sunday update for this 19th day of September 2010. And now for the real news. More signs have emerged in recent weeks that the so-called superclass of well-connected globalist elites are concerned at the grassroots political opposition that threatens their plan to institute a totalitarian world government for the benefit of the ruling oligarchs. The latest round of hand-wringing on the part of the globalist controllers comes from an op-ed in the Bilderberg-owned and CIA-affiliated Washington Post in which Charles Kupchin, a senior fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations, laments that the European Union is faltering because of widespread opposition from populist political movements. Europe is experiencing a renationalization of political life 
with countries clawing back the sovereignty they once willingly sacrificed in pursuit of a collective ideal, Kupchin writes in the opinion piece under the headline, As Nationalism Rises, Will the European Union Fall? For many Europeans, that greater good no longer seems to matter, Kupchin continues. They wonder what the Union is delivering for them, and they ask whether it is worth the trouble. What this op-ed and almost all other mainstream reportage on the EU fails to note is that the European Union enterprise was from its very inception the work of Nazis, business monopolists, inbred royalty, and the other rich, eugenics-obsessed social engineers of the Bilderberg Group who realized that totalitarian world government is the only way for them to implement their plans of total control over the population of Europe. Last year, a researcher named Adam Lieber uncovered a U.S. military intelligence file known as the Red House Report that detailed a meeting of top Nazi officials on August 10, 1944, in which a plan for the creation of a Fourth Reich based around a European common market was discussed. The plan called for key Nazi officials and German industrialists to set up offshore front companies to be used as centers of influence in post-war Europe to lead the construction of a pan-European government. Ten years later, in 1954, the Bilderberg Group met for the first time in Oosterbeck, Holland. Co-founded by an ex-SS officer, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, the group discussed from its very inception the creation of a common European market and a single European currency. A BBC radio report on the Bilderbergers from 2003 reveals how every major European institution was founded by Bilderbergers. The conference papers show exactly what was discussed within the secret confines of Bilderberg. What's striking is the degree of consensus reached by those at the meeting on contentious topics like European integration. Okay. <coughs> Here's another interesting, um, it's another paper from the first one, it's about the European Union. It's interesting here saying some sort of European Union has long been a utopian dream, but the conference was agreed that it is now a necessity <laughs> of our times. <laughs> Only in some form of union can the free nations of Europe achieve a moral and material strength capable of meeting any threat to their freedom. Yeah, yeah. So this is 50 years ago saying we must have a European Union. Yes, yes, yeah. But again, reflecting the fact that many of the people involved in planning Bilderberg had also played leading roles in getting the European movement going in the late 1940s and early 50s and the fact the Americans want it so much as well because they want a, a stronger Western Europe to resist possible Soviet aggression. Without Bilderbergers, Europe could be a very different place. From his study of the group, Mike Peters, a sociologist from Leeds Metropolitan University, is convinced that members of Bilderberg helped to conceive, create and establish all of the major European institutions. The single currency was mooted first by people who were connected with Bilderberg. The sheer wealth and importance of the people who attend Bilderberg suggests that this is one of the most important political forums in the modern world. In recent years, however, there has been growing awareness of the ulterior motives for the creation of this dictatorial non-democratic Central European government. After the European co Constitution was voted down by French and Dutch voters in 2005, the Europeans rebranded it as the Lisbon Treaty and once again set about ratifying it, this time with even less input from actual European citizens. When the Irish voters voted down this sovereignty-destroying document, the Europeans, remarkably enough, made the Irish vote on the exact same treaty again one year later this time after a joint Brussels-Dublin marketing campaign that broke the referendum laws of both Ireland and the European Union itself, the Irish were tricked into voting for the treaty. In another particularly notorious demonstration of the anti-democratic authoritarian nature of the European Union, members of European Parliament walked out of a speech by Vaclav Klaus that was, ironically, addressing the European Parliament's unwillingness to listen to opposing views. But with the installation of the new president, Herman Van Rumpy, who had himself attended a special Bilderberg meeting before being selected for the position in a completely opaque and non-democratic process, came renewed opposition to the European dictators in Brussels. Nigel Farage of the UK Independence Party has been at the forefront of exposing the real backgrounds of the leading European bureaucrats. President, Mr. Barroso says, I think my team is of high quality. Well, let's conduct a human audit. 
Now, I'm mindful that audits aren't very popular in the European Commission and that auditors, if they do their job properly, get fired, but nonetheless, here goes. From France, we have Mr Jacques Barrault. He'll take on transport. In 2000, he received an eight-month suspended jail sentence for his involvement in an embezzlement case and was banned from holding public office for two years. From Hungary, we have Mr Kovacs. He'll take on taxation. For many years, a communist apparatchik, a friend of Mr Kadar, the dictator there, and an outspoken opponent of the values that we hold dear in the West. His new empire will produce <laughs> taxation policy and he'll look after the customs union from Cork across to Vilnius. Are the EPP and British Conservatives really going to vote for that? Yes. From, es from Estonia we have Mr Kallas, for 20 years a Soviet party apparatchik until his newly acquired taste for capitalism got him into some trouble. <laughs> Though, to be fair, he was acquitted of abuse and fraud, but convicted for providing false information, and he's going to be in charge of the anti-fraud drive. I mean, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> From the UK, we've got Peter Mandelson. He'll take on the trade portfolio. He, of course, twice was removed uh, from the British government. Yet, to be fair, he's one of the more competent ones. <laughs> from the Netherlands, we've got Nelly Kroos. She'll take on comp uh, competition. She's accused of lying to the European Parliament. Now, these may only be allegations, but they're made by Mr Van Boytenen, and I think should be listened to. Ask yourself a question. Would you buy a used car from this commission? <laughs> Now, as the European economy begins to slide into chaos and the euro itself is on the verge of dissolving, the globalists at Bilderberg, the CFR, and other front organizations for the real power centers of international geopolitics are running scared of a genuine people's resistance movement based on the idea of local autonomy and individual sovereignty. Earlier this year, Zbigniew Brzezinski expressed his own frustration with the growing political involvement of the public pointing out how this, plan, this was interfering with plans for global dictatorship under an authoritarian, non-democratic world government. The other major change in international affairs is that for the first time in all of human history, mankind is politically awakened. That's a total new reality. Total new reality. It has not been so for most of human history until the last 100 years. And in the course of the last 100 years, the whole world has become politically awakened. And no matter where you go, politics is a matter of social engagement, and most people know what is generally going on, generally going on in the world, and are consciously aware of global iniquities, inequalities, lack of respect, exploitation. Mankind is now politically awakened and stirring. The combination of the two, a diversified global leadership, politically awakened masses, makes a much more difficult context for any major power, including, currently, the leading world power, the United States. At this time, it remains to be seen whether the free peoples of the world can increase their pressure on this, the non-democratic institutions that presume to override national sovereignty, or if the people will be persuaded to give in by the corporate media propaganda that globalism is a necessary and inevitable step in the evolution of society. Look for this debate to happen nowhere near any contro corporate controlled or foundation funded media outlets. Earlier this month, Bob Chapman of the International Forecaster joined the Corbett Report to discuss the po possibility of a people's uprising in Greece. I get a letter uh, from a subscriber. Uh, his brother went to a wedding of very wealthy people, industrialists, and they told him that on September the 20th, or between the 20th and the end of the month, there's going to be a coup in Greece. Now, I mentioned that yesterday, and I did it, I did it specifically on uh, Drew Rain's The Marine Disquis Disquisition, which I've been doing for over five years, and I no sooner put that information out, and we had an email from the detachment in Athens of the American Marines that are there. They said, you're absolutely right. We've been on alert, and we're told the same thing, 
and it's coming down. We don't know when, and we hope it's bloodless. So I think if that happens, and I think really that's the best thing for them. I mean, they've been drained long enough. If it happens, it'll spread. Uh, the next place probably will be, I would guess, Ireland or Spain. Both of them are right. Uh, Ireland is really in terrible shape. Their banks don't know what to do. They're out of money. Uh, they put in austerity about eight or ten months ago. It's dreadful, but they're bearing up under it. But I think they only can take so much. Uh, Spain <coughs> um, has a leader who um, is very naive. Let's just put it that way. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, Spanish subscribers, and they describe to us the attitude of government there. So they're very vulnerable. Um, but if Greece leaves the euro, I think the other four, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, and Spain, will leave as well. And the euro will break up. Everybody will go back to their currencies. That could eventually break up the European Union. Now, please go to CorbettReport.com to download the audio MP3 of episode 146 of The Corbett Report, Lessons in Resistance, Building Communities, where we talk to Dan Fox of Urban Garden Magazine and Douglas Lane of the Diet Soap Podcast about the radical nature of building communities around urban gardening. Welcome, my friends, to episode 146 of The Corbett Report Podcast, Lessons in Resistance, Building Communities. In some senses, learning how to resist the New World Order couldn't be easier. All one has to do is take a look at what is being propounded in the corporate-controlled media and what is being done by the governmental bodies that are bought and paid for by the corporate interests that are run and operated by the ruling oligarchy, and then to do the exact opposite. Georgia County sues farmer for growing too much food. DeKalb County is suing a local farmer for growing too many vegetables, but he said he will fight the charges in an ongoing battle the neighbors are calling Cabbage Gate. Fig trees, broccoli, cabbages are among the many greens that line the soil on Steve Miller's more than two acres in Clarkston, Georgia, who said he spent 15 years growing crops to give away and sell at local farmers markets. It's a way of life, like it's something in my blood, said Miller. In January of 2010, DeKalb County code enforcement officers began ticketing him for growing too many crops for the zoning and having unpermitted employees on site. Miller stopped growing vegetables this summer, and the charges were put on hold as the property rezoned. Two weeks after approval, however, his attorney said the county began prosecuting the old charges, saying he was technically in violation before the rezoning. It should go away. I think it borders on harassment, said Miller's attorney, Doug Dillard. Miller now faces nearly $5,000 in fines, but he said he plans to fight those citations in recorder's court later this month. A county spokesperson said officials can't discuss the matter while it's in court, but neighbors were quick to come to his defense. When he moved here and I found out what he was doing, I said, Steve, you're the best thing that's ever happened to Cimarron Drive. And I still say that, said neighbor Britt Faisu. So fortunately, in this kind of situation, neighbors and the community are coming out to support this. James, this is... Another one of those kind of strange, ridiculous stories that you almost have to tell folks, no, this, this isn't the onion, this isn't satire. Yes, they're trying to regulate dust coming from farms. Yes, here they're prosecuting people for growing too much food. And part of me wonders if the real sticking point is that he's giving it away. You're cutting out the, you know, the bigger farm. That's, you know, that's really seems like when the, when the crackdown comes is when you're avoiding the overall scheme, if I can make another kind of drug reference, not that I would support anything like crystal meth, but I always found the crackdown on crystal meth really interesting. And when I heard it pointed out that, well, it's something that people can pretty much make on their own, and it doesn't require the international drug cartel. So now, having said that, James, what, what's your take on this situation? Well, yeah, you're right. I think absolutely the, the impetus here is to, to get people to stop... Uh uh, even thinking about the idea of building a community based on building, growing their own food and sharing that food with others. I mean, that's, that's absolutely anathema to the system that we're living in. So unfortunately for this person in Cabbage Gate, uh, he's going to have to uh, 
put up with all these zoning laws and everything, right? Because what else can you do? Uh, no, certainly this is the type of thing that more people should be fighting and more people should be doing. And in fact, this is going to be something I'm going to be talking about in my upcoming podcast episode being released this Sunday uh, about building communities. And a big part of building communities is growing your own food. And uh, in fact, I just talked to Dan Fox, of uh, the editor of Urban Garden Magazine, talking about this very type of issue. So um, if people want to check that out, it's also up on my interviews tab right now. But suffice it to say, this is, I think, one of the most important things that people can be doing on an individual level to fight against the system we're in is simply to start growing your own food. And, and this, again, kind of strikes me as the situation that if everybody started to do it, the prosecutions would be powerless. It's you know, one of those situations like, what are you going to do? Are you going to arrest all of us? Exactly, exactly. Our strength is in numbers, and we are m- much more numerous than people would, might think because of the controlled media telling us that we're all alone. But no, there are a lot of people out there that want to do this. And, and if they go out there and do it, then yeah, absolutely, they, they will be powerless to stop it. Yes, that was the latest edition of The New World Next Week with my co-host James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. And no, you cannot make this stuff up. A man is truly being taken to court by the Georgia county in which he lives for planting too many fruits and vegetables on his property. Again, you cannot make this up. And unfortunately, as my listeners might suspect, this is absolutely just part of a large and growing trend in the United States of crackdowns on the mortal sin of attempting to grow your own food. Now, listeners to episode 81 of the Corbett Report podcast, Surviving the Collapse, might remember an article that we read, SWAT Team Raids an Ohio Organic Co-op, from back in 2008 that was an example of this trend uh, that occurred before this latest Georgia incident. But rest assured, there are many, many, many other such incidents taking place in municipalities around the United States, including New York City, of course, where we have this article from beta.wnyc.org. Green thumbs down, community gardeners concerned about proposed city rules from July 9th, 2010. We also have the Constitution Party of Allegheny County coming out with an article just on September 3rd of this year, 2010. Pittsburgh wants to regulate community gardens. We have the Dallas Observer from May 8th of this year, 2010. City Hall continues to bury community gardens under permits and procedures. We have the Oak Cliff People at oakcliffpeople.com from Oak Cliff, Texas, with a story, Mariana Griggs Ain't Okay with City Option for Community Gardens, talking about regulations or proposed regulations on community gardens in that community. And again, as I say, this is happening in municipality after municipality all across the United States, almost as if it was a coordinated agenda to crack down on the recent phenomenon of people planting victory gardens or urban gardens or community gardens or attempting in any way to replace the system that we've been placed on of industrial food production and the purchasing of our food in supermarkets with a local community-based option in which people are growing their own food organically and without the intervention of an industrialist middleman. As I said at the beginning of this episode, it is easy to resist the New World Order agenda. All we have to do is do the opposite of what is being promoted in the corporate media or what is being told to us by governments. So not only, obviously, can we start by creating community gardens or spaces where people can grow food in our communities, which is the obvious way of resisting this, but we can also look at a deeper level at what is really taking place here. Because this strikes on one of the fundamental questions of our age, which is really, who has control over your community? Is it you and the people who live in your community? Or is it some regional government that's seeking to regulate and zone and tell people what they can or can't grow on their own property? Is it some federal agency that can come along and try to regulate things, like the EPA coming to regulate farm dust, as James Evan Pilato alluded to in that episode of New World Next Week? Is it a national government that seeks to create laws and rules and regulations for what people can and can't do in their communities, or the way that communities must be laid out? Is it community associations that are trying to tell people, like Andy McDonnell of Levine, Arizona, that he can't even fly a Gadsden flag on his house because it goes against the homeowners association's regulations? 
Who is in charge of our communities? How have they been created? And why have they ended up in the state that they are in today, where people don't even know their neighbors, people don't even take times to establish relationships with their neighbors, and even if they wanted to, there's no community space anymore for doing such a thing? How have we been placed in this situation, and who does it benefit for us to be so isolated within our communities and separated from our neighbors? Well, these are the types of questions that we face when we start to confront the issue of building communities, which, of course, is not only the physical, literal act of building a community, but also the psychological, the sociological act of coming together as a community to support each other in times of adversity and to build those relationships that will be necessary when and if the grid that we've been placed on is shut down for the pleasure of the ruling elite. As I believe I've alluded to numerous times in numerous different episodes of this podcast, there are many different facets to this and many important aspects of building communities, community structures, community organizations, and community methods for supporting each other in in times of adversity. That can range from things like community currency to community gardens, or it could even be taken at the local individual level by people just deciding to grow their own food, that in and of itself, as we see in this recent Georgian example, can be a revolutionary act and can go against the status quo, i.e. the system of community that we've been placed into by the ruling oligarchs through their corporate-controlled regional governments. It's at this nexus between urban gardening and radical politics that I'd like to begin today's episode by taking a listen to an interview that I had the chance to conduct earlier this week with the editor of Urban Garden Magazine, Dan Fox. It was through one of those funny synchronicities by which things like the Corbett Report are shaped that I had the chance to encounter Urban Garden Magazine when Dan Fox contacted me asking for permission to reprint my article slash video When False Flags Don't Fly in his magazine. I thought it was extremely interesting to think that an urban gardening magazine would be interested in printing such a contentious and such a political article, and of course I was happy to give my permission because I'm always happy to try to reach out to new audiences whenever and wherever possible. And so the When False Flags Don't Fly article was printed in the July-August edition of Urban Garden Magazine, which can be found at urbangardenmagazine.com. Dan Fox was good enough to send me a copy of that magazine, and I was able to discover that there is an extremely interesting mixture of gardening tips and advice and radical, even revolutionary politics going on in this magazine. So I would highly recommend that people go to urbangardenmagazine.com to check out some of the content that's available there, and of course purchase a copy if you're able to. I'll also include in the documentation list for today's episode, which as always can be found by clicking on today's episode in the episodes tab of CorbettReport.com and then clicking on documentation, some files that Dan Fox sent over regarding Urban Garden Magazine, including covers of past issues. But right now I'd like to take a listen to part of the conversation that I conducted with him earlier this week in which we discussed the nexus of politics and urban gardening and how such a magazine really came about. And as always, I'd like to remind listeners that they can download the entire interview from the Interviews tab of CorporateReport.com. But right now, let's listen to Dan Fox talking about Urban Garden Magazine. I guess that brings us back to your magazine, because earlier you mentioned that the uh, advertisers would generally prefer that you know a magazine like yours would stick to the main issue, so to speak, and not talk about eugenics or the monetary system or uh, false flag terrorism or the like. So certainly you must be up against some corporate pressure to, to do what you do in the magazine. So tell us about how, how you've come to cultivate uh, your advertisers and your, your audience and, and the way that they react to these types of issues. Well, first and foremost... Um you mentioned uh, earlier about the, the kind of the stigma that people have when they hear the word hydroponics or, or indoor gardening, um, and they think it's um, for the cultivation of illicit crops. Now, hydroponics is an ancient technology and has amazing potential. And we're talking about a technology that can grow food using 80 to 90% less fresh water than conventional agriculture, and we've seen what we've done with the with cl- climate change and the encroaching deserts and the decrease in arable land and how 
precious fresh water is, is becoming, we need to look to technologies such as hydroponics and bioponics, which is what really excites me. That's like an organic version of hydroponics. Um, we need to look to these technologies in order to meet the, the food requirements of our increasing population. Um, I mean, we've all heard of um, the population explosion and 30,000 people are dying of starvation today. But it's important to point out that those people aren't starving because of a shortfall in production. They're starving because of poor distribution and politics and corruption. So I'm not saying that hydroponics is going to save the world um, or anything of, of um, you know, exaggerated as that, but we certainly are looking to push hydroponic food production more into the mainstream. I see the hundreds of apartments that they've built in Vancouver and all these empty balconies, and I would so love to see them filled with, you know, opulent amounts of tomatoes and, and leafy greens and all sorts of things. It's amazing what you can grow in such a small space using hydroponic technology. So we wanted to, to introduce a magazine that really promoted hydroponics, but also contextualized it in, in, the, urgent, um, in the urgency that I believe we need to address food production locally. Um, I, I, I walk into a supermarket and the last thing I hear are sighs of relief when I see um, shelves packed full of fresh produce. And I think I'd like to hear more sighs of relief because most of us are so completely reliant on the supermarket that if the food was to be taken away, we would surely starve. I don't mean to be alarmist, but it's important to note that Layered on top of this, we're completely reliant on a fiat currency debt-based dollar system, money that's not representative of anything of intrinsic value like, well, gold and silver it used to be, but money that, a form of money that's totally reliant on, that's totally based on debt, controlled by private banks. And it's this money that's going around in debt circles and ever being devalued that we're all reliant on to survive. I mean, a visiting extraterrestrial might be forgiven for equating life on planet Earth with a system of normalized slavery. There you have it. Yeah, well, that's, that's exactly right. And that's something that obviously I've turned to time and again in my podcast, in my work. And I have talked about uh, the, the value of starting a garden or starting something indoors before to my listeners, because it certainly is uh, a, not only a, a revolutionary act, but I, I would say sort of a necessary act in, in the current climate, especially the current economic climate, how, how could you afford not to have some sort of backup and to start building those communities that will be necessary at some point when we start to, to get ourselves off of the system that's been created for us. But uh, unfortunately, I, I must admit that uh, perhaps uh, I'm not walking the walk. I am a bit of a hypocrite. I, I don't have any plants growing in my apartment. What would you say to someone who's right now starting from base zero with uh, two, two black thumbs and no green thumbs and uh, has never actually tried to do this before? What would you say to someone who's just starting out in this? Well, if I can do it, as a supermarket kid of the 70s, then I really believe that anybody can. Growing plants um, and saving seeds, and we've been doing this for, for millennia, and we're all living proof of that. The fact is that over the last 100 years, society has changed a great deal, and, and many people have moved from agricultural-based communities into urban-based communities, and as such, we've lost that connection. I mean, it's, it's talked about very often. Um, it's interesting to note that at school, I wasn't taught how to grow my own food. I was given careers advice. I, was, I took psychometric tests, and they said, Dan, you should be a lorry driver or truck driver in, in America. Um, or I'm given advice on... Uh, I don't know, physics and maths and stuff that I rarely use in everyday life. Um, but we're not really told very much about money issuance, and we're not told very much about growing our own food. Um, so for someone just starting out, obviously subscribe to the magazine. I'm only kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's so much information on the Internet 
on, on growing your own food. Start simple. Start with an easy crop. Um, and like, for instance, lettuce is, I mean, you really have to try not to grow lettuce. <laughs> Uh, just grab yourself a small planter. You don't have to go hydroponics. Just buy some potting soil um, and, and grab some seeds and find a sunny window or buy a T5 um, high-output fluorescent grow light, which are very efficient. They use maybe 55 watts of energy. And here in BC, the growing season is really short, so I love my fluorescent grow lights just for starting off seedlings and getting them up to kind of teenage size before um, hardening them off and, and putting them outside and getting a head start on all my neighbors. Um, it really is so much fun, and it really does connect you with backward nature. I hear these talks of people talking about the nature deficit syndrome. And much that I hate these um, created maladies um, I do believe that many of us are suffering from something that could be described as that. Um, start easy, start small. It's wonderful to, to be a caretaker of a plant. Um, and I think it's really part of our heritage. And it's a wonderfully therapeutic thing to do when you get in from work or whether you do other things with your daily life. So the main thing I can say is get your hands dirty. And if you want to try hydroponics, there are... Uh, all sorts of amazing small systems that can help you grow three to four times the amount of produce in the same square footage. So space and, oh, I've only got a small apartment, these aren't excuses that, that we listen to. Um, we're open garden after all, so we hmm. believe everyone should grow. Once again, Dan Fox of Urban Garden Magazine, which can be found at urbangardenmagazine.com. Well, there's absolutely no doubt that growing one's own food and building a community around the sharing and growing of food can be a revolutionary act in these times, as ridiculous as that might seem to some people who have a more agrarian mindset. But unfortunately, the more agrarian mindset has been almost completely eradicated from our modern Western industrial societies to the point where it's almost ridiculous to think about growing one's own food when one can just go down to the supermarket and buy it. But I think we now understand very well how such a system can be controlled and how the eugenicists who are at the top of so many of today's corporations can engineer into our foodstuffs the very biochemical weapons which, with which they hope to reduce the world's population. And we've seen that time and again, unfortunately, in this podcast as well. But the existence of industrial food production and the purchasing of our foodstuffs in supermarkets are, of course, not the only way in which we are delimited in our thinking about communities and not the only way in which our current every everyday communities are being suppressed. There are many different aspects to this, and it is a complex psychosocial phenomenon, and unfortunately one that has been taken into great detail of account by the social engineers who take a great pride in manipulating every aspect of our lives and attempting to put us into those Skinner boxes through which they can train us to do their the complicated motions that otherwise would be impossible. And for those who don't quite get this Skinner box illusion, please listen to last week's episode 145 of this podcast, You Are Being Gay. Aimed. But having said that, it's important to begin examining the psychosocial geography of the spaces that we've been put into and how that affects our interactions with our neighbors or, uh, unfortunately, increasingly, the lack of interactions with our neighbors in our everyday lives. One person who has been producing some very interesting work taking a look at this phenomenon is Douglas Lane at douglaslane.com. He's also the host of the Diet Soap podcast at dietsoap.podomatic.com. He's an author and philosopher who has put a great deal of thought into such things as the revolutionary act of taking a walk around one's own neighborhood. As ridiculous as that might sound to some, it in fact, unfortunately, is in our current day and age something of a revolutionary act to do something like take a walk around the neighborhood in which you live without any other purpose than simply to chart the geography and the psychosocial dynamics of the area in which you're living. Doug Lane has also talked about the idea of abundant cities, that is, cities that can be and in some cases already are 
bountiful with all of the stuff that we need to live on an everyday basis, including the food stuff that's growing all around of, around us, but unfortunately largely going to waste because no one is bothering to pick those blackberries or to pick those apples that are growing on the trees and bushes that line people's yards and are really just there for aesthetics, rather than serving the function for which they are actually there or should actually be there, which is to feed the community. So, again, very interesting work that's coming out of Douglas Lane. And it was my great honor to talk with Douglas Lane just yesterday about his concept of abundant cities and about the situationist philosophy and taking walks around one's neighborhood and all sorts of very interesting things. So I would highly, highly encourage people to listen to this episode interview in its entirety by going to the Interviews tab and downloading the MP3 from the CorbettReport.com. But right now, let's listen to a short extract from that talk in which we start by talking about Doug Lane's walks around his neighborhood and what his perambulatory philosophy has taught him about communities and psychosocial geography. Well, again, I think in our, unfortunately, in our modern society, even such, even such a, an action like that can be seen as somewhat revolutionary because it is so <laughs> against the norm to actually go out and explore your own community it's it's almost you know unbelievable right well and you know what you if you do it um what i noticed was that that i felt like i was trespassing a good portion of the time Mm -hmm. walking down streets that my house isn't on and not having and not knowing anyone in that area uh and especially when i was with my son and i would stop and point to an interesting house or an interesting yard or what have you i felt like i was violating people's privacy and that's not because anyone – that's because of the way we zone residential areas. It's not because of the people who live in those houses, but it's the way that we push all these houses together and create these little tiny boxes of private space with no public space left in them. There's no room for community uh, in our residential streets. I mean, you need like a library or a cafe or – or a local grocery store, or a communal garden, or some place where which isn't a privately owned home, uh, in order to have, in order for communities to happen. That's right, but unfortunately, Google has no compunction about people's privacy, so they let, they're happy to cruise up and down streets and take photos and scan the <laughs> Wi-Fi. <and, laughs> right. Yeah, yes, no, that's right. true though. It, it certainly does create that sort of that feeling that there is this private space that you just can't really enter into unless you have a reason to be there. And it does create that mindset. So certainly I think the just the way that our communities are physically laid out has such a, a psychological effect on us. Yeah, it, I, I, I think it does. And that's just like the very grossest, most obvious kind of surface read of it. I mean, uh, as I wander more and I go out again, I notice more uh, more details about it. Like, so for instance, in my neighborhood uh, in, in Portland, actually, there's an urban forest project, which you, which I, on the surface, would support. Could plant a lot of trees. It's great for the. It's good for the air. It's good. It makes the city more beautiful. But what it also does is cover up the social relationships that are going on. So if you're driving through, you kind of feel like you're out in nature or you're, you know, you're in, a, in almost this utopian neighborhood, but you don't notice all the wires that are running through and also all, all the fences and that first level read, you know, how everyone's cut off from one another. Um, so it's like we have this veneer of greenery over pretty much uh, a space that's as alienated as any uh, uh, inner city neighborhood <laughs> you know like a, if you if you strip those trees away you would still just be concrete and fences really and uh, that's a, that's important to notice too is that's kind of the, some of the facades that are up there Right. Well, okay. Well, not to complicate things too much, but I understand that you also tie situationist philosophy into this. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I'm pointing to with when I'm talking about the the walking and the wandering. Um, the situationists were, uh, for people who don't know, they were artists and, and revolutionaries in France in the 50s and 60s, and they were involved in the May 68 um, strikes. But before that, they were mostly artists and theorists. And one of their major tools to fight uh, the the exploitation and capitalist system that they 
uh, were a part of was to wander Paris and create new maps of Paris based on the psychogeography or the psychological ambiance of different neighborhoods. So I've been using that that wandering technique to get a get a sense of my own neighborhood. And what you do is when you're doing one of these situationist wanders or these uh, what they call a derive is you let the built environment you're in direct your walk. So you're not aiming to go any particular place, but trying to react to the architecture and the layout of the city or the neighborhood. Um, and in my neighborhood, uh, in the Woodstock neighborhood of Portland, what I found is that it's such a grid that you you feel very much directed like an electron through a circuit or something. You're not, it doesn't flow very much. <laughs> you, have, you have to kind of get closer into the city center to get, to kind of get breathing room. Actually, I, I discovered that when I would get into more industrial areas and areas where there are more uh, commercial buildings or uh, bars, I could breathe easier because there was more space for me as someone who wasn't going home, <laughs> you know, when I was in these areas. Um, but yeah, so that's the situationist uh, technique, is this this wandering. The situationist theory was that we live in a society of the spectacle where everything is presented to us as an image that we can't ever get our hands on. So the world, the political world especially, is something we watch but don't influence or impact. Basically, as consumers or spectators, we consume or watch the world, but we don't influence it. We have no means to influence our built environment. Right, and imagine how much more true that is, you know, 60 years after the situationists came along. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's absolutely just so apparent now, I think, but it must have been a somewhat interesting idea back in, the, back in that day. Well, you know, they were dealing with the arrival of television, um, and they were dealing with uh, uh, an ascendant America at that time, and, and the pop and popular culture as we know it was being born around the time that they were starting their projects. So it wasn't like it was invisible to people then. But now, in fact, maybe the fact that it wasn't so pervasive made it more visible to people then. Because now you talk about the spectacle, and... You know, it, it's either people don't see it at all because it's like the air they breathe, or you're just talking about the most obvious thing in the world, and why even bother to mention it? <laughs> yeah. Douglas Lane of douglaslane.com, L-A-I-N, Douglas Lane. And uh, once again, I think that was an extremely interesting and very philosophical conversation, so I'd like to recommend that people go and download that interview from the Interviews tab of CorbettReport.com if they have not yet done so to listen to that conversation in its entirety. Once again, suffice it to say that our communities are being physically constructed and laid out in ways that influence the way in which we interact or fail to interact with the people around us. And unfortunately, whereas there used to be town squares and public spaces that were not any way, shape, or form private, and which could be used freely for gatherings and for community events and for sharing of ideas and for using those public spaces to hold political and other types of debates, unfortunately we see that almost every public space is now being taken over by commercial agencies or put into private use by private homeowners who increasingly have absolutely no contact with each other. And we are beginning to lose not only a valuable part of the human experience, but one of those very mechanisms by which we can resist the encroaching new world order, which is all about centralization of power and getting us detached from one another. If you and I have nothing to do with one another on a daily basis and we have no reason to interact with each other, then how deep can our relationship ever be? And to what extent will we ever be able to form any meaningful resistance to the system that is taking shape around us? Well, this is a complicated subject and obviously, as I'm sure you are well aware by now, can branch out in many different directions. And uh, there are many different ways to articulate the necessity of taking back our communities, of investing ourselves in the space that we 
inhabit every day and actually taking pride in where we live and starting to dig up the dirt and roll up our sleeves and get dirty and actually do something productive with the land on which we live. But perhaps I'm not even able to properly express or articulate exactly what all of this amounts to. But again, in one of those synchronicities that tend to happen when you're producing something like the Corbett Report, I was listening recently to the latest episode of The Free Zone with Freeman that was released on September 11th, 2010, in which he was talking about pretty much this exact subject, and within the span of about five or six minutes, he manages to encapsulate every single important point that I think needs to be said on this subject, and says it in a way that I think is more articulate than I could ever have put it, even if I had sat down and really tried. So I will leave the final words of today's episode to Freeman of freemantv.com and highly suggest that people check out his work because he really is one of the few people that's providing a truly positive and hopeful message of peace, community, and love through which we can effectively fight the psychic control that really is the New World Order. If we are not building our communities, then they are being built for us. And who do you think is building them, and for what purpose? Well, once again, I will leave the final words of today's episode to Freeman of FreemanTV.com and suggest that people go there for more information about the ways in which we can fight back against this New World Order encroaching control grid. But that's it for today's episode. And I am your host, James Corbett, thanking you very much for joining me for today's episode and asking you to join me again next week for episode 148 of the Corbett Report podcast. Media kills. So when we begin to look around and we start to see right there in our storefronts all over the the fashion of today, what we see is a post-apocalyptic world. We see clothing that looks already battered and deranged that has been through hell and back and is now being worn by someone who's seeking some sort of sanctuary. We see it in the bold haircuts and the closed minds, the idea that they're staring at their feet as they walk towards the robotic path on their life to life, which doesn't exist. There is no place like home. It's been stripped away. The mother's been taken away and put off to work. And the people that were left in the next generation had no sense of the love of nurture. We don't cater to plants, to life, to anything around us. We barely make our houses livable, much less put in the nurturing love necessary to make it beautiful. And when you look around at your world and you see that what is put out before us in city streets and uh, in towns even, that they have no beauty, that there is no art, there is no love, there's nothing engendered or nurtured in the whole situation, and this is where people come along with their graffiti and try to put their egos upon it. If that street were beauty, if if the works were art, no one feels the need to go and plaster something upon it. As a matter of fact, they feel opposed to the idea and they're led to catering and nurturing to that beauty. But this beauty's been stripped away. It's been taken with the mother and the mother was taken from our homes and now we all live in this existence that we believe we're running on a treadmill, looking out to the future saying, well, maybe one day I'll win the lottery. Then I could have a beautiful home. Maybe one day I'll figure out what it is that I am and I'll be able to have a job that pays me the way I deserve to be paid. And the whole time as we're standing there waiting for that one day to come forward for us, meanwhile, everything around us falls into disrepair. And because we feel transient, because no one actually owns the properties that they live upon, then they feel no need to nurture or cater to that property and make it a better place than it began. The houses, the buildings, the storefronts fall in disrepair as no one will apply their own loving, creative powers to it because it's not theirs. And it's this mindset of transient, of feeling that nothing is yours, that needs to be taken care of right in your own personal being. There's no thought game out there. There's no construct that you're trying to design in your head that's going to bring it about. No Venus project that's going to bring you solutions. It's right there with you. Now, I don't know if any of you have sat out there and watched Clean House, (laughs) one of my favorite shows, really, as we watch these people in their turmoil and their despair and their distress, and they realize as these psychologists, (laughs) 
is what you could really call them, the clean house crew, come in and clean out all of their negative karma, all of the things that have been surrounding them covered in dust, things that they've never touched in their lives, and they remove all of that from their worlds and put them and transport them into a clean world. But the trick, the trick of the whole show is actually that it's a psychological difference because otherwise you're just going to dirty the house again. And you have to work through your own inner struggle, your own sacrifices, and finding the surrender necessary to uh, apply yourself to the real world, the third dimension, that one that's right in front of you. How many of you sit there on your computers listening to people talk about intellectual methods of saving the world while your dishes are piling up and your toilet needs to be plunged? Uh, things of the third dimension are, are looting us because we don't even feel that we're a part of this world. And on top of that, we're built with the guilt. We're filled with all of this anger that has been generated through things like the BP oil spill or just nuclear bombs. The very fact that humanity has this destructive capabilities is all placed on your shoulders as if it were you. And we find that the elite don't feel this guilt. They don't mind at all. They're putting it out there. They're blowing up 9-11. They're taking down buildings. They're causing BP oil spells, earthquakes, floods, and have artificial intelligence stealth robotic vehicles coming down to attack you. They feel no guilt about this, and this is what keeps them in charge. Because it's the mentality that we craft before the event happens that actually manifests as reality. So as long as we sit back cowering in our houses going, which one's the agent? Who's listening to me? How can I speak my truth if I feel like I'm going to be arrested? And we stand in this place where we know they're coming to get us. That's what we will get. The very fear that we feel, the very sense that we have, no place like home, is the very thing that's going to bring the fact that you will have no home. So it's time to stand up. It's time to feel sovereign. It's time to feel that you are yourself and that you are okay and that you belong on planet Earth. And then it's time to take this land that you have, even though that you don't own it, and it's time to dig up and start to plant some gardens because this is the one method and the only method that's going to allow the survival through the mentality change because that's what we're going through. It's a mental change, and our universe is mental. Everything that comes from our minds is then transported into reality. And it's this very method that the Brotherhood have used to keep dominance over the inhabitants of planet Earth by building massive pyramids, by building colossi of Memnon, by building large banks, by building city structures, and even the very languages used, they have crafted and controlled reality. Now we believe it's true. So when we start from a place that's inside of our hearts, the one that says this is home, we can actually manufacture that into reality in the third dimension.